Welcome back to the wardrobe, which is, uh, it's going okay in lockdown. You know, this is where I work now. Uh, most of what I've been doing is recording audiobooks, some of them with um, some quite racy scenes in them. Not that comfortable. But one of the things I'm really enjoying is this weekly show on podcast radio in London that I do from here called The Pod 20 where I count down the, the top podcasts. You can hear it at 5 o'clock every Friday, and it also becomes a podcast itself. And I get to talk to guest podcasters every week, and I've just finished having a chat with Sam Walker in Arizona. Now, Sam is a broadcaster from way back. She was on 5 Live, BBC 5 Live, National Network. But she started out at the bottom like everybody else, she didn't actually get into broadcasting till she was 30, which surprised me. She's just gone for another big life change and has moved her life, her family, in her late 40s, two kids, to Arizona, where she makes podcasts. And one of them's won a major award at the British Podcasting Awards. It's called Desert Diaries. And it was great to talk to her. She's a ball of energy and an inspiration. This is my chat with Sam Walker. So, first of all, congratulations on the award, Sam. That's cool. Thank you. <laughs> no, I still can't quite believe it. <laughs> um, I'd still, it's about the only kudos I have with my 12-year-old daughter is that I was, in the, I was mentioned on the same, in the same sentence as George Ezra. That's it. That's pretty well, he, good. He got silver mum, and I'm like, yeah, I know, but, you know, I was mentioned in the same sentence as him, so there is a little bit of kudos there, but the only kudos I've ever had or will ever had with my 12-year-old, so happy days. It's a shame you, it wasn't an actual ceremony because of the situation we're in, and it was a, a virtual thing, though, wasn't it? Did that, that disappointing? Well, it, it is what it is. I mean, I think there's, there's been so many conferences I've meant to have gone to and and events to take part in that have just fallen by the wayside since March so really it, I think they did a really good job I mean it, it was so challenging with all the different technology they had and trying to get the people on the doorsteps with the winners but and I love the sort of Oscar style uh you know pictures on the screen in the zoom rooms that we were all in so I think they did a good job and happy days I only needed to get dressed from the waist up Graham so you know Yes. Correct. Very pleased. <laughs> so did they do you? I didn't actually see it. Did they do you on the doorstep thing in Arizona? Well, no, because they only went to the doorstep of the gold winners, not the oh, silver and okay. bronze. Okay, okay. So, right. uh, yeah, I did say they, asked, they got in touch, you know, a few weeks before, as they did with all the nominees and said, look, if you win, can we have your address? And I was like, you can. <laughs> I don't think you're going to be rocking up, but <laughs> you, here it is anyway. No worries. <laughs> So let's get a bit of background then, uh, how you ended up where you are, which will lead into the podcast. So after 16 years, as a very, very well-respected BBC presenter and producer, you, you quit the whole thing and started a new life. Tell me about the journey there and the thought process. Oh, it still it seems <laughs> insane when you say it like that. Um, I don't know. I mean... I, as I know you would have heard, the, the first episode of the podcast, I mean, they're all very short, short episodes, all the episodes, but the first one's a really long one. So it's about 14 minutes. Um, but it talks about that whole process. And I think it was just, you know, a mixture of so many things. I think we've all got that little dream, haven't we? Whatever it might be, whether it's to move to America or another country, whether it's to quit it all and work with horses, whether it's to breed miniature guinea pigs, whatever your little dream that you've always wanted to do, we all have one. And it was just something that never went away in my head. And, and it was something that my husband, Dave, and I just talked about all the time. Oh, we'd love to do that. We'd love to do that. We'd love to do that. And a bit like when we decided to have children, we'd always thought we want to have kids. We want to have kids. And then at one, one day we went, if we don't do it now, it's never going to happen. We're never going to have enough money. We're never going to have the right house. We're never going to be the right point in our careers to have a child. We've got to kind of just do it if we want to do it. And I think for a variety of different reasons we reached that point a couple of years ago where we thought wait a minute what? every time we go to the states we're like oh I'd love to live here and see what it's like we'd love to try it and then we'd go home and do 
nothing. We do nothing about it. Apart from we'd be a bit miserable and think, oh, it'd be great to take a chance. But it's frightening, right, to take a chance and take a risk. So lots of things happened. And I was at that stage in my life as well where we just thought, if we don't try, we didn't know if it would work. If we don't try, I think we're going to kick ourselves. And so we were visiting a friend, also a radio friend, Ian Canfield, really close friend of mine. We were visiting him in Phoenix. He'd moved out here a few years ago to work in radio and he'd been to visit us the year before when we were in San Diego and given us the big sell about this desert city surrounded by mountains and cacti where for two months of the year it's so hot you can barely go outside, where there's coyotes and javelinas, these kind of crazy little desert pigs and scorpions and snakes and it's just this amazing wild west city. And he talked, he kind of sold that to us. And so we came to visit the next year. And so it was in 2018 that we were standing in his pool, having been in Phoenix a full 24 hours, where my husband Dave just turned to me and went, this is it. Let's do it. Let's try it. And he got his phone out and he literally, he works in tech. He Googled his job, senior data scientist, Phoenix. And a job came up. And there and then in the pool, he applied for it. And we had a laugh and we put the phone down and we went, ah, ha, 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 And then two weeks later, we were watching yet another animated children's film at the Trafford Centre Cinema in Manchester. And his phone kept ringing and it was an American number. And we were like, who's, ring who's this? And when he picked it up, he realised it was his company going, hey, can we talk? And I'll give you the short version to say, the rest is history. The long version is, of course, visa processes, terrifying decisions. Are we actually going to do this? Will it work? What if we hate it? And all the things that come in between that moment in the pool and us sitting on a 747 taking off from Manchester with me sobbing, going, what have we done? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> it's been a wild ride. So the total number of people you actually knew in Phoenix was one? Right. Yeah. Yeah, we, we met a friend of his, a lovely friend of his, Kathy Coz, um, for about an hour. <laughs> so we kind of knew one in a bit, uh, but that was it. And, you know, it's spoiler alert as it comes in the podcast. Uh, he moved not long after we moved here. So then we didn't know anybody. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, we didn't know anyone. It's a huge city, sixth largest city in the States. And yeah, we didn't know anybody. It's a big move, uh, a much bigger move than the one my wife and I made. My wife and I had been married. We lived in New Zealand. Julie's a Kiwi, and I was living in New Zealand at the time. And, and uh, we'd, lived, we'd got married, and three years later, we went for a week's holiday in Sydney. And I oh. said, this is great. And at the yeah. time, I wasn't in radio. I was an air conditioning engineer. Ah. So we went back home. We put the house on the market, and I think it was about six weeks later. We just arrived in Sydney, and we didn't know anyone. And... You know, um, I looked in the yellow pages and found a job, you know, fixing air conditioners and, and, and we were away and we didn't know anyone in Australia. And it's, it was in Australia. I got, ended up getting into radio. So it all worked out great. But it is a, it, yours was a much bigger move for us. Like, you know, Sydney's only three hours from New Zealand. <laughs> You, you're what is it eight no it's a it's probably a 10 hour flight 12 12 it's, it's 11 and a bit direct from Heathrow but from yeah. you know when where a lot of our family and friends are in Manchester and yeah it's it, you're looking at 12 hours easy so yeah it's quite a way <laughs> and and what have you been doing then for work because he'd have the work permit through his job how about you did do you get part of that as a spouse no, so I have got my own visa, my own work visa. So uh, for the last, goodness me, four years of my on-air stuff with the BBC, I'd actually set up a company, What Goes On Media, where I produce podcasts for businesses and individuals and brands and organizations. And I'd set that up as a sort of side hustle because I really love create. I love creating stuff. I love making something and I'd made a podcast what goes on here which had been commissioned by Audible which is fantastic so I'd made a few seasons of that and then I just started slowly but surely to making things for other people and again it's one of those strange strange moments where you realize that things that have happened over the last few years suddenly go like that and you're like oh wow so when I had that call 
following I joined a you know a, an email list service from years before for American radio folk and I started chatting with this brilliant woman who runs a podcasting company in LA and we talked about collaborating because I was doing stuff in the UK and she was doing stuff in the US and when I said to her blimey I think I'm gonna move to the state she went come work for me I, I you know I, I, I want I want you I want to have you in my in my back pocket you know I would love to have you as someone I could I could help work on a lot of my projects so I've got a completely separate work visa. So we're both on what's called an O-1 visa, which is the process of cutting. It's just like some sort of horror story. It's so complicated. You have to evaluate your entire life and write everything down. But um, it's, it's, yes, it's quite difficult. And um, so he's on a separate visa. I'm on a separate visa. Um, and so I've, since I've been here, I've been doing loads of work for her company. I've been doing work for the clients I still have in the UK and I've, yeah, I've been crazy busy, actually, really, really busy, but really loved it. And it's been really exciting. And even at times where I've just been working r ridiculous hours, I think just meeting a lot of the reason of moving is I wanted to meet loads of different people and work on different projects and just have new experiences. And that's absolutely happened, which has been great. Some of those experiences have been awful, as I'm sure if you've listened to the podcast, you will know. But a lot of them, most of them, you know hugely hugely positive and i've loved you know i'm currently working on a big podcast for a law firm in chicago i've just done one for a a big retailer an online retailer so it's it's been really exciting to do lots of different things and uh you know i still get a kick over the fact that people laugh at my accent all the time it's, i just forget but well, you've been meeting people i mean you're not in new york or la or, or you, you you'll, you'll be meeting people all the time that have never met an english person before yeah, I mean, Phoenix is a big city. It's yeah. not like it's not a quiet backwater. I think if I moved to one of the other towns in in Arizona, for sure, there there are some really small towns here. But I mean, Phoenix is a huge city. There's quite a large British population here, yes, unbelievably. There. Yeah, there is. I mean, I I haven't gone fully involved, but there's quite a big sort of Brits in Arizona Facebook group, which is thriving. I've bizarrely met a bunch of British people since I've been here. Someone who's become a really close friend of ours on sort of day four of being here we were walking our dog through the park and this other dog came up and really started barking at my dog and a man came up and went oh sorry about that and I was like your voice sounds a bit like my voice where are you from he went Manchester and I was like what and you know he was he was from Presswich so he's become really? a firm friend it's it's bizarre there are quite a lot of Brits in the desert unbelievably but um I think it's definitely still a novelty and I found especially the children <laughs> the children walk into a shop or if you walk into a coffee shop and they say, excuse me, can I have a... Everyone's like, oh my gosh, oh, the British children. Something about British voice on a child, which is a trigger in a positive way for a lot of American people. It's really quite lovely. Yeah, I think they're going through a whole Mary Poppins thing there. Or yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and tell me about your setup then, because, you know, as you can see, this is my wardrobe that I do the podcast radio show from. Yours looks very similar. Well, it is kind of similar. I'm just lucky in the States that most bedrooms have walk-in closets so yeah. it's kind of like a big closet so i'm able it's it's very similar i've got a focus right interface i've got a few rode microphones i've got um a nice usb one i use outside when i'm doing zoom calls in my main office and you know it's it's great and it's and you know you said i'm not in new york and i'm not in la and in, in a weird way now doesn't matter where you are right it really right. doesn't matter where you are I mean as I said the one project I'm working on was with a bunch of people in Chicago a project I just wrapped I had a host in Oakland in California interviewing people in places like Jackson Wyoming and South Carolina and you know the company I do a lot of work for is in LA and it doesn't matter where you are there's a great audio community here in Phoenix actually and we did used to meet up before you know what turned up and ruined everyone's life um yeah. but hopefully next year we'll be able to meet up again because it's a lovely community yeah you picked your time didn't you you really did <laughs> i tell you what it's but like you say the business the business you're in with audio it's uh, it i think it's changed everything i think there's a lot of people once this is all over who will continue to work from home because it's just more efficient and, and, and you get more. I did, I did feel very lucky, and I'm sure you felt the same, Graham. I did feel very lucky that, that when COVID hit, I know a lot of people really struggled with home working. They really struggled with that transition of being in an office environment to working in a quite isolated way. 
being audio folk, we're used to that. I mean, even, even when we were, quote, in the office, maybe we were in a radio studio for four hours, three hours. We might have had a producer through the door, depending if we were on the BBC or commercial radio, quite often not. And it is, in a way, quite a solitary, unless you're part of a sort of big breakfast format, it's quite a solitary existence. I'm, you know, I'm happy sitting with my headphones on, editing away or writing and recording stuff in my little booth. And, and so that was one thing that I felt very grateful wasn't a big transition. Having two children, yeah. needing homeschooling, and suddenly my husband going, I need to use Zoom now. I was like, nah. <laughs> you know, that's been more challenging, <laughs> but that's just family. <laughs> so getting back to, to making the transition from living in the UK to living in the USA, what was the biggest adjustment? That's a really tricky question. Um, I think the things that have surprised me is a sense of not knowing how things work. And I'll explain. I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid forties, probably late forties now, I'm 48 now. And, you know, I've been a kind of grown up quote and I have bought a house and I've sold a house and I've got married and I'd have children and I've got an accountant and all these things that kind of come with being quote a grown up. And so I kind of thought I knew how things worked. Moving here, when you arrive here, you, you're a ghost. You don't exist. You have no credit history. I obviously didn't have any reputation here. I mean, you very kindly said, oh, you know, I'm a well-known radio presenter. No one knows who I am at all here, you know, and I found that hard when I was starting out getting some work because I couldn't go, I'm all, I was on Five Live for a zillion years. People would be like, oh, what? <laughs> no one cared. So it, yeah, right. So it's been hard to slowly build a reputation up from times that has felt like scratch, but it, it's more a sense of being here I'll give you a very quick example. We arrive here. I, uh, my husband gets a paycheck. We want to go and open a bank account. Can we open a bank account, please? Yeah, sure. Can I have your driving license? Yes, here you go. What's that? Well, it's our driving license. No, it's not an American driving license. Well, we've only been here a week. We don't have a driving license yet. Oh, well, I can't open a bank account without a driving license unless you've got a utility bill. Well, we were in an Airbnb for two months because furniture's in the Atlantic it's on a boat. We haven't, we haven't got anywhere to rent yet. Oh, so you don't have a rental agreement? Well, no, because we're in an Airbnb because we don't have anywhere to live yet. So you can't open a bank account. What do you mean I can't open a bank account? Here's a check. Please let me give you... No. Let's go and buy a car. Oh, you've got no credit history. We're not going to let you buy a car unless you buy it outright. Well, I don't really have 30 grand lying around to buy a car or whatever it might be. I can't remember. Um, well, you, 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 you don't have any credit history. I tell you what, we, we, you can give us $10,000 and then pay us $1,000 a month. And, and that's okay. You know, it's exhausting and really difficult. And I didn't realize how tricky that would be uh, just to get set up. My children's school, they didn't have the right immunizations under Arizona state law to be accepted into a school because they demand chickenpox immunizations here. And I'm like, they had chickenpox when they were babies. They don't need the jab. Oh, Arizona state law says you do. So there were a few things like that, that just everything felt incredibly difficult to do something as basic as getting your child into a local school or opening a bank account. The driving test was, again, we needed to have utility bills to prove our address before they'd let us apply for a driving license. It was catch 22 and at times, you know, that felt completely insurmountable. And all the time, we're also trying to adjust to a life in a new country and make sure our children aren't feeling a shock of the transition. My husband's starting a new job. I'm started working with some people remotely. And, you know, it's it can be massively overwhelming. And did you have to actually take your driving test again? Yeah. The yeah. practical driving test? Had to take a driving test, which, yeah, was... I was really scared. I, hadn't I mean, I told him when I was 17. Yeah. I mean, bizarrely enough, this man, bless him. I don't think he was born when I first took my driving test. That's how young he was. And I got in the car with him and he went, how are you doing? And I went, oh, I feel really nervous. And he went, it's okay. You, you got this. You got this. And I was like, you're so sweet. But at the same time, I was like, you're a child. This is crazy. Um, but it was 
it was ridiculously easy. I mean, you have to take a full written test beforehand. And I last took an exam in about 1990. I mean, goodness me, I just, I, that for me was a big deal. Some of the questions, Graham, are amazing. Um, if you're driving along a freeway and a dust storm rolls in, what should you do? <laughs> a, put your lights on. B, turn your lights off. C, pull to the side. I mean, it was just, what? Uh, one sign was like, what does the, what, one question was, what does this sign mean? And the answer was rodeo ahead. Um, <laughs> another question was, uh, you know, you're pulled over the, by the police and you have a firearm in your car. Do you A, B, C or D? And there wasn't an option of, I'm never going to have a firearm in my car. It's never going to happen. So uh, that was trickier than the test itself, which was basically getting in. I mean, they're go-karts here, the cars. They're all automatics. It's yeah. spectacularly And the easy. roads are really wide and there's no roundabouts. Oh, yeah. There's no, well, there's a few traffic circles, as they call them here. Oh, and everyone okay. freaks out as soon as they get near them because most people don't see them. The biggest joke was I had to parallel park. I'm in Phoenix. Every single parking space here is a big, huge parking lot in a mall. I've never known anyone have to parallel park ever. So that was funny. Luckily, I spent many years in London and Manchester. So parallel parking was not a problem at all. And being away now, how long have you been away? So now from the UK? Just over a year. Just over a year. May. We moved here in May 2019. Yeah. How has your view of Britain changed looking at merry old England from the outside? I, I'm not like one of those expats who moved to another country in a, a very disparaging of the country where I lived in for the first 40 odd years of my life. You know, I've met plenty of people here who are like, oh, that country's gone to the dogs or, oh, it's a... It's a dump. I absolutely do not feel that way. I've got really great fondness, really great fondness. I we may move back. I don't know. You know, I don't. I, one thing that this last year has taught me is it's really hard to plan for the future because you don't know what the life what life is going to throw at you. So I would not be against returning to the UK. I don't like I said. I don't feel like one of those people who's moved and it's like yeah, good riddance. I feel massive affection towards it. Um, I really miss some people there. I really miss my dad, who's still in the UK. I, you know, and I've, that's one thing during lockdown I've struggled with. It was almost a bit easier when everyone in England couldn't see any of their friends and family either. Um, now it started to open up a bit and I've got all the pictures of grandparents being reunited with their grandchildren. I think, oh, I, I can't do that. You know, I can't get to Australia where my mum lives. I can't get to, well, I can fly into England, but I can't get back out again because I'm not a permanent resident here. So I, I wouldn't be allowed back in. Um, I think the things that I have realized about the attitudes that I experienced from a lot of my working career is it's okay to big yourself up. It's not a problem in this country. You walk into a room and you tell people how good you are. That is, we don't do that as British people. It feels very weird to do that. Um, I mean, I, I was on a call the other day and actually the person, it, we happened to be all women and the kind of chair of the meeting went, okay, let's just do a lady brag to start. Tell me, tell me why you're brilliant at what you do. I found that very hard. <laughs> I was thinking, I'm British. We don't, we don't do that. We just, we expect people to know that we've worked hard and blah, blah, blah. So that, that is something I've noticed is that we're not very good in my experience in the UK of, of really shouting about how great we are. I think here there is less of um, less of a problem around asking for what you want. Yeah. Whereas in England, we might be a bit more, oh, well, I really want that, but I don't really want to ask that because I want to seem greedy and I don't want to seem pushy and I don't want to seem like, oh, I don't want to get above myself because why should I earn that much money or ask for that much for a project? Or here it's like, no, you ask for it. If you don't ask for it, you're never going to get it. Yeah. And that is something that i'm 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 learning to do and it's and i like that good in your business because you're you're running yeah. a business you've got to be an entrepreneur you've got to wheel yeah. a deal so to feel comfortable with that would actually be an advantage i would have yeah thought. yeah 100 percent. and i think you know that's definitely been something you know a few times i've pressed send on a quote and gone ah! and in my head i've got people going well i don't know who she thinks she is you know goodness me why would she be the right person for that project and then people have come back and gone great and yeah. i thought oh Oh, okay. Woo. Could have asked for more. So, yeah, he's like, exactly. That's what my husband says. Like, when if they don't argue down, you've you've not asked for enough. And I'm going, ah. <laughs> so I think, you know, that's that's definitely something not being within a kind of corporation environment as well 
as as that's helped me kind of expand and grow and and you know it's been really interesting to see how things that make us flinch as Brits just not an issue here you know at all let's talk about you then a little bit so whereabouts do you grow up so I grew up in the Midlands in a little town called Uppingham which is uh kind of halfway between Leicester and Peterborough mm -hmm. and an early child can you tell and uh and uh, yeah, my dad was a teacher and my mum worked in an office of a big paint container factory. So we were kind of a pretty regular family. Um, and yeah, I went to a school in Oakham. I got like a bursary thing to go to a, a private school. So I was an only child, as I said. So I, I, was, um, I was privately educated and always felt quite a fish out of water there i mean i made some friends there who i've still got friends for life but i always felt quite a fish out of water in that whole environment i think because you know i remember like one friend coming to to, to stay for like afternoon tea and she was a lovely girl but as we drove up to my house she went oh i didn't know you lived on an estate and there was that kind of you know people didn't have houses with numbers in that school people had houses with names and i'd never experienced that you know and so I think that was a bit tricky. You know, we used to have to, and I'm not saying sob story at all here, but we, have to, we used, to have, used to have to push our car every morning because it didn't have a choke that worked. So every morning I'd be in my school uniform and I'd have to push the car down the road so mum could drive me to school. And I used to pray that she wouldn't stop the car when she came to pick me up from school or I would have to push it down the road, start it at school in front of everyone else. So that was something that was always just like, oh, please don't let her stop the car, please, please, please. Cause it was just, you know, it was really, really tricky. But, you know, I'm so massively lucky to have had that education because it, you know, it taught me so, so much. And my mum my and dad had such a strong work, work ethic. I mean, my mum had never gone to uni. She'd not finished school. Um, my dad had gone to uni, but um, not until he'd worked in the family building firm for a few years, you know. So for them, education was absolutely everything. And that was, you know, I was the kid who was never allowed out. <laughs> I had to do so much homework. Uh, so I was allowed out one day in the week till nine o'clock and one weekend day. And the rest of the time it was like, get your work done. So that was, that was very much how I was brought up. So how did you get into broadcasting? Took me a long time. Took me a really long time. And it was a total confidence. It was total confidence thing. So I'd left university and I'd gone to London and I wanted to be a journalist. And I'd done some work experience at a couple of major newspapers and magazines. And I remember doing some work experience with The Independent. And they sent me to the House of Lords on the first day. And I was wearing a suit and I had to, had to kind of do a write-up about some law reform that had come in. And I thought, oh, this isn't me this is not me at all and I just I didn't just feel like a duck out of you know duck out of water I felt like yeah it, it, I didn't even want to get in the pond you know <laughs> I just thought this this isn't me and so I really faffed around for want of a better word I mean I worked really really hard but I didn't know what I wanted to do um, for most of my 20s and I, I worked in various temping agencies and I worked for a while for an in-store radio group which I loved and there was a guy called Clint Bell who ran Virgin Megastore Radio, which is where I met Ian Canfield when he was 16. And he said to me, you'd be good on the radio, you would. And I went, oh, no, 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 no. And he said, oh, you know, you would be. Come down to, um, you know, Oxford Street, Tom Court Road, Oxford Street, where the big Virgin Megastore was. Have a go in the studio. And I had a go for half an hour and I cringed so much at the sound of my own voice. And I thought, I've got nothing to say. I've got nothing interesting that anyone would be interested in hearing. Not for me. And so I didn't take that opportunity at all because I just thought no one would be interested in me. And it wasn't until a couple of other little career loops later where I'd run a recording studio for a bit. And again, it was one of those moments where people I'd met along the way made me go, oh, wow, suddenly all that's fallen into place and suddenly here's a new possible career path. And there was a guy called Johnny Hayward who turned out to be my first ever program controller and he'd worked at, I want to say Mercury. Were they radio stations in Kent? 
in the 90s. It was, a GW, was it a GWR station? I think so. I mean, again, this wasn't my world. I wasn't in the radio world at all. Yeah. So he'd, he, he was, uh, you know, he'd, he'd done, he'd had a fairly successful radio career. He also did a bit of kind of cool DJing in, uh, in uh, kind of the old street area of London. And I've been to a few of his nights. But long story short, he started, he started to be program controller of this tiny little radio station in southwest London in Kingston called Thames 107.8. And I was living in Camden at the time and um, he called me up and he said, look, I've just started doing it. Cause I, he'd done some voiceovers at the studio that I'd worked at. And he said, I remember, you know, talking to you and you've, you've got, you did journalism. I was like, yeah, yeah. And he said, I think you've got a really good voice. And I was like, oh gosh, have I? Mm. And um, I'd done some PR work for his wife as it then turned out. It was one of these things where I said everything kind of slots in together cause I'd done some work in PR for a few years. And he said, come down to the radio station and I, I need some news readers. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> give anything a go. I wasn't really working. I was working at a PR firm. I was doing a bit of marketing. You know, I was one of those bits and bits and bits with lots of different people. But you hadn't had a broadcasting job and you hadn't read a newspaper. Never, never, oh, okay. never. But I'd done this post-grad journalism and I'd worked a bit in newspapers and he said, look, it's this tiny station. They're probably gonna pay eight pence a week. You know, it was, it was let's give it a go. So I went down and he was presenting the drive program because it was, it was that station where the boss also did, you know, 50 other things. And um, he said, right, come in. And I sat down in front of them, you know, opposite the desk from him. And he went, look, I'm about to do the travel news. He said, look at that screen there. There's the travel. Can you read the travel? And I was like, oh, okay, fine. I'll give it a go, you know? And I sat there and he put the fade up and he was like, right, let's get the latest travel news now for Southwest London. Here's Sam Walker. And the light went, the red light came on and my microphone came on and I read the travel. And in the 45 seconds it took me to read the travel, the heavens had also opened and angels came down going, this is it. This is what you want to do. You were this you were is what you want there. to do. Because yeah. I hadn't known. And I was just shy of my 30th birthday when that happened. And I had no idea. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And I remember going home and going I, I need to do that I, that's what I need to do and I went back the next day and went into and I found this confidence that I'd never had before ever and I walked into the boss's office this you know the, the managing director and said I want to work on your station give me a job you need to I'm really good and he was like what experience have you got and I went none <laughs> but I'm really good and as I said I don't know where this confidence came from it was almost like once I had the purpose I found I found the confidence yeah and a long story short was he gave me a job but that, and, that enthusiasm you know i've hired people before uh, uh, and that enthusiasm you can't you can't buy that is more important than anything because you can learn skills basic skills yeah. someone's got the drive that's what you want that's it so that's you've obviously won him over pretty quickly yeah and i and i then started presenting the breakfast show i won't tell you what i earned graham but put <laughs> it this way it was less than my rent yeah, you lived and in Camden. Yeah, I was. Yeah, oh, well, I lived. Yeah. Well, this was quite a while ago, so it was when Camden was vaguely affordable for normal people. Forget it now. Yeah, um, I'd lived in Belsize Park before that. Hilarious. This is when normal people could live in Belsize Park, <laughs> and um, and so I used to have to drive my clapped out Golf, which again had battery issues. So I always had a little charger. I had to start the car with. <laughs> And I would drive at four o'clock in the morning from Camden. In fact, I think I was in Belsize, still in Belsize then, to to Kingston in Southwest London. It took me 40 minutes to get there and two and a half hours to get back. Yeah. I earned no money at all. I went to massive, 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 massive debt. And every day I couldn't wait to do it. I could not wait to do it. And it was, oh, it was amazing. I was presenting a breakfast show with Rick Adams who'd presented, you know, the big breakfast. I know, I, I met Rick uh, because I worked at 2CR in Bournemouth and uh, Rick had Rick had He was at uni there, out, yeah. Yeah, he'd, he'd started out there and he was still well regarded uh, by people in the, in the area and by people at the radio station. Yeah, he was a huge Kenny Everett fan. Oh, yeah. he's it's still a really good friend of mine. We've kept in touch all these Where years. Where is he now? He's LA. Is he? He lives in LA. Um, He's brilliant. He is one of, he's a genius. And I don't, I, that sounds such a naff thing to say. He is genuinely one of the most naturally funny people I have ever met. He is warm. He's brilliant. He, 
has not had half of a tenth of the recognition he deserves. Yeah. But he taught me so much. It's great to be year. around somebody like that, isn't it? Oh, because they, they have an aura and that and when you're in yeah. their orbit, you can suck you, you, the, 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 the enthusiasm and the, yeah. yeah, we can do this. And you go, we can. I never thought about that. But, you know, those kind of people in totally in we would write sketches. Yeah. We'd write write four or five sketches every morning. Brilliant. around ridiculous things we did like full-on scripts in fact i found them the other day because we recently moved house here in phoenix and i was reading through them all going this was to give away a cheese hamper <laughs> because we had no pre we had no prizes it was a hamper of freaking cheese <laughs> and we wrote this entire character-based drama i mean it was just ridiculous but it was the best training round and johnny yeah. hayward who was the he doesn't work in radio anymore, but as the, as the program controller there, he drove me up the wall. He drove me up the wall every day. Right, five past eight, you didn't say the station name. 20 past eight, you didn't do that. And I was like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It really it matter. doesn't. Well, it kind of does when you're trying to build a rate. What, what it taught me is that really good housekeeping is actually... Well, yeah, I'm just guessing do it once and you throw got it away. five live, you were, that was a that was a lessons well learned. Yes, that's what I mean. And it was, yeah. it was. I didn't know anything about radio. Okay. I'd just gone in a bit gobby to a boss and gone give me a job. I didn't know how it worked. I couldn't believe people said the station name. I was like, no one ever says the station name. Of course, you start listening and you go, oh, they do, don't they? Yeah, they really do all the time. And when it's a breakfast show, of course, they also say the time. Yeah notice that so all of these little things I and mean, then he sat on our back for a year he, he used to drive us out three times a week right let's drive to um stains today this is in your tsa what do you know about stains what are the name of the big pubs there what are the names of the and i was yeah. like oh yeah brilliant no, absolutely good. brilliant and it just you know if you're a local radio station to know your patch yeah yeah and another rough it, areas the posh areas Everything, exactly that. Yeah. So, so at that time, you'd gone through. Is it is it unfair to call it a myriad of vocational cul-de-sacs before you got there? Okay. I didn't but, to... enough, they now all they now all slot into what I do. Being able to write well, being able to know how to tell a story, being able to know like even through PR and marketing about branding, all of these things have now come into play. It's crazy. But I felt I wasted my entire twenties. So you did all that, you were doing all that with, with no real direction. Then you find your direction, except it doesn't really pay enough to live on. Your parents have paid for all these years of private schooling. You they are were still their paying only for it. child. They were probably, yeah, they were still paying for it. How were they with, with your life decision? Were you under pressure from them to sort yourself out? They basically, so, yeah, I mean, I... I to give you an idea of my family as i said you know my dad was a teacher my mom worked in an office um we used to have a push our car down the road to start it we weren't woe is me on the breadline poor but w i never went on holiday as a kid i went on holiday once in until i was a, an adult and that, that was to america because when freddie laker probably where it all started I when tried. freddie laker you know got those tickets out and my dad queued up at the estate agents in um, the travel agents in northampton and got three tickets and that's the only time he ever we're about six quid, family. Yeah. It, was it was amazing, but you know, I didn't realize when my parents got divorced when I was 23, 24, and I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't mind me sharing it, but a big part of the settlement was who pays off the rest of the school fees. And I got a bur and, I, and I'd left school six years earlier. Yeah. And I also had a bursary, which means I had quite a few, bit of my fees paid by the school. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, <laughs> no wonder we never went on holiday and had a car you had to push. I am so aware of the massive sacrifices my parents made for me so, so where wife. were they at that period in your life when maybe in their eyes you weren't a success and you didn't they didn't see a path to success like you did how were they with with you then what was that kind of pressure like um my mum they'd split up and my mum was living in australia my dad was living in africa in wow, Tanzania. Up. Jeez. Yo, yeah. Uh, there's a whole other story. But, and I had recently left my first husband as well. So I was literally living on someone's sofa with no money. And this car, you had to put, you know, a battery thing on, pack on to start. But was that and, good for you, though? Because you knew you, you were responsible now for you. There was no fallback position. Yeah, totally. And, and I remember saying, 
I've got this opportunity and I want to do it. And my mum sent me, and I've still got them on my fridge now, two, frid two magnets. One is a quote, which I can't remember off by heart, but it's basically about, you know, cast off the bowlines, sail out, discover, explore, dream. And the other one just said, never, never, never give up. And they both said, if you've got a passion and you found something you love, you've got to go for it. You've got to go for it. And I remember my grandmother sending me a few hundred quid because that's all she had because she said, I really want you to do this. I really want you to try this. And I know that you're going to be successful. I know you are and you need someone to help you while you're trying. And so they 100 bazillion percent my husband works in his state. He'll be very upset. He's like, there can only be a hundred percent. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> they, they supported me. I'm so grateful and lucky for that, you know, and you know what it's like working in radio. It's absolutely horrendous. And the first time someone told me that and then did the opposite and promised me that job and then took it away. I was like, what, why, why is this go What's happening? You know? Um, but they 100% supported me the whole time. And they supported me when I had absolutely no money and would literally send me food parcels and and they helped me and you know not not financially quite often because they didn't have that money but in ways that supported me and when I had like twelve thousand pound debt on my credit card because I had to do that to pay my rent because I wasn't earning enough they were like it's okay you're gonna do it I know you will you're clever you'll you'll find a way you will you'll do it and right. I did I got part-time jobs so I was on the radio in the morning and then I was working at a PR firm in the afternoon to kind of boost up that money so I was exhausted um but you do you find a way if there's something you're really passionate about you do do it and there's something about that time i always look at i look back at the time you know i'd 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 not had very supportive parents and i'd found myself as an as an air conditioning engineer in sydney australia but it just wasn't me mm. and i got accepted into the top radio school in Australia, the Australian Film TV and Radio School in Sydney. It's the, they only take 12 wow. students a year and I got on that. And when I got, I always look back on that. It was the most broke I've ever been because I couldn't work. You know, Julie was working yeah. in, a, in a, this is how long ago it was, in a shop that developed a uh, one hour photo kind of place. Julie was doing Weren't that. Weren't they cool when they came in? Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was doing that in Sydney, you know, developing pictures of the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge. And um, I couldn't work for six months while I did this course, but it's that hope that, wow, my life, if I get this right, if I work hard, I, I could have something really special here that I never even dreamed someone like me could get. And I always look mm -hmm. back as that, was the best time it still is i still think of that as the when was the you know if you think about your life that was the best time so this this people who have a relationship with money, money's important don't get me wrong but i also look at the time when i was earning the most money i ever earned in my life and i was the most miserable that's so it, true 100 <laughs> something about having that hope the, the, of of the future, not of the now. The now really yeah. doesn't. We're supposed to live in the moment, and I don't know where people. And I'd love to live in the moment, but you don't. You live just a little bit further ahead of the moment. That's what keeps you going. And uh, yeah. So and and what did you find that 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 was just one of the best times ever when you? Yeah, I think there was, and I I've talked about it quite a bit since actually. I mean, just with with friends and and family. But I think the time when I was living. I'd left my marriage. I was living on my friend's sofa, earning no money. You know, this is before we then got a flat, um, which I moved in with my friend, but I was living on her sofa for a good six months. So I was homeless. What I was, um, I lived out of Sainsbury's carrier bags. I had no money to spend on anything frivolous. Um, and I would get in the car with my little battery pack to start up the battery every morning. I had to walk about five streets away probably more than that, even now, probably a good 10 streets away because where my house had used to be, and that was the zoning for London. So I could park my car there, but I couldn't park my car where I was staying with my friends. So I had to walk at four in the morning to the car, open up the bonnet, start the car up, drive, do this radio show for five pence, come back, then drive to Dulwich to do some PR. And it's weird. I think I also felt really alive, you know, really alive. Everything was incredibly difficult. 
but you do bizarrely look back on that with fondness. Yeah. It's a bit like now I look back on those first few weeks in the States when everything was massively overwhelming. We were like, where do we live? What's happening? I look back on that with fondness. Yeah, it's exciting. No, yeah, because it was exciting. I mean, it was also terrifying and yeah. my husband was losing the plot going, we can't even open a bank account. What are we going to do? We can't rent a house because we've got no credit. Ah. But I think, I think you're right. It's that anticipation of, I'm going to fix this. Yeah. I know I'm going to fix it. Don't know how I'm going to do it yet, but I know I'm going to do it. And, and that, yeah, that is a completely wild, <laughs> wild state to be in, but it's really exciting. So how did you go from that, from the, the radio station basically part-time, how did you go from that to BBC Radio 5 Live, a national radio network. I know you were at BBC Radio Manchester. For, yeah. how, how did you join that those dots to go from, from the very bottom rung of the radio ladder to right at the very top, national BBC network radio? How did you madness. do Madness. Isn't it madness? I don't... <laughs> madness. It's madness. I don't... I mean, it, and it happened in a... I mean, I didn't do this till I was 30. Yeah, it did all happen really, really quickly. You were, what, you were thirty when you were working in the in the station. I was oh. just shy of my thirtieth birthday. I was thirty. I was in the twenty-seven minute. when I got into radio, so I, and I felt like I yeah. left it late. Well, I've, exactly, and I was meeting people who were thirty who'd been in it twelve years, and I was thinking, what? Yeah. And um, so it was kind of crazy. And so I I worked at Thames on a seven point eight. Uh, I lost my job in PR because I kept. I was so tired because I was getting up at 4 a.m. and having right, to walk yeah. and, you know, so I, I lost that job. The radio station got bought and turned into what is now Radio Jackie. Rick left and went off to be amazing in America. Uh, I did a few shows on there and I got a Saturday show. So I started to do a solo show, which I found really exciting. And then, very long story short, um, I talked to Juice 107.2 in Brighton. Yeah. And I ended up moving to Juice in Brighton and earning a bit of money, not huge amounts, but a bit so that I could um, rent a house, um, which was great. My now husband, who I'd met during that first year of being on radio, um, had gone to live on a desert island in the middle of the South Pacific. Hello. <laughs> for over six months so I he he'd kind of just moved in 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 London when I had moved to Camden and I phoned him and went just to let you know when you come back from your desert island we live in Brighton now so he was like okay and so he was a scientist he's a research scientist so uh we moved to Juice in Brighton where I had an amazing amazing 18 months where I ended up being PC of, of Juice and I did the drive show and my poor liver Oh, I don't know how I got through that because being the little, you know, a, a big fish in a little pond and you know how many bars and clubs there are in Brighton and there's always yeah. something opening. You're always invited to some gig and it was amazing. It was the most brilliant, wonderful time. And I just got to the stage where I was like, I kind of feel I've done it. And I, again, I just wanted something to feel something bigger. And I sent three demos. Oh, someone got in touch with me. That was it. And said, oh, I'm a radio producer in Manchester. And I was in Brighton for the weekend. And I just thought you were really good. And I wanted to tell you that. And I thought, well, that's really nice of someone to do that. No one needs yeah. to do that. Yeah. And it just made me think, Manchester, Manchester, Manchester. And so I sent two demos. I sent a demo to Key 103. And I sent a demo to Radio Air. Radio Air never replied. <laughs> Key 103 said, come and meet me. And so I got on the train to Manchester. And they offered me a job and I went, okay. And I came home and said to my husband, well, he was still my boyfriend at that point. I went, should we move to Manchester? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, okay. So again, the support, oh, good having the support of people, so, so, so important. And so we moved to Manchester and I worked for Key 103 for a year. I hated it. I left and I was sitting at home just before I was about to leave going, what am I gonna do now? what am I going to do? I don't know what to do. And the phone rang and this voice said, hello, I'm John Ryan and I'm the editor of BBC Radio Manchester. And I said, what? <laughs> and knowing John as I do now, I heard him sigh and go, <sighs> I said, my name is John Ryan and I'm the editor of BBC Radio Manchester. So I went and did a demo for them thinking, I can't believe the BBC have rung me, the BBC. And went and did a demo and they went, very nice, no thank you. And so I went, oh, 
oh. And then three weeks later or whatever it was, I left Key 103 and I just dropped them online and went, just to let you know, I've actually left Key 103 now. And they went, come and talk to us. So they'd gone from saying no thank you to okay, let's talk. And um, and that was it. I started working for for them. In the meantime, I'd gone off, oh gosh, anyway, blah. I then did a, other things on commercial radio in the meantime. But that was the start of my work at the BBC. And um, and lots of people just used to come up to me and say, you should be on Five Live. You should be on Five Live. And I didn't really know what Five Live was. And I was like, okay. And it was really nice that people said that, but I didn't know how to do it or or how to get there or anything again. I didn't know and what to was do. Was Five Live in Manchester then? Or was it, no, was it, it was in London. It was in London then, yeah. It so London. It's, it's, then there was the radio festival in Lowry and I went to a talk and Jonathan Wall was there. Yeah. And he was the commissioning editor at the time of Five he Live and I went, Five Live. Wall. Yeah. So I went up to him at the end and went, give me a job on your station. And he said, I've heard of you. People keep mentioning your name to me. And I went, oh, do they? Blimey. Oh, okay. And then it was probably a good year of me hassling him and hassling him and hassling him and sending him demos and him saying back off um, that I was seven months pregnant and they'd moved to Manchester at this. No, they hadn't. No, they were about to move though. They were still in London. I was seven months pregnant. He said, can I have, can I have a chat with you? So I walked into this bar, enormous, and he said, um, I've got a job, do you want a job? And that's when I'd started the Sunday. So it, my daughter was six weeks old and I would get on a train on a Saturday afternoon crying because my baby was six weeks old and I was insane. Uh, get on a train crying, cry all the way to London, trying to read the notes, stay in a hotel overnight, get up at six, go into the radio station, a complete mess, present a show, get back on a train, come home crying. And I did that for about six months <laughs> until they moved to Manchester, by which stage I was a little bit more stable hormonally. So it was a bit better. But um, again, it was a case of seeing an opportunity and just going, oh, I'll just do it. I'll work it out. I'll work out how to do it. It's fine. And I do remember Jono saying to me, are you sure you want to do this? You would have just had a baby. And I was like, yep, 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 yep. No problem. No problem. Um, In Australia, they have a great expression, which I always remember. And they say, if you want to get off, you want to get on in life, you got to bite off more than you can chew, and then chew like baggery. And <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good rule to have. It's a good rule to have. So that's now true. it's about the podcast. I mean, it's about lots of podcasts for you, but the one we want to talk about is the award-winning Desert <laughs> Diaries. So tell us how that all started. Then was it? Be well, obviously, it was because you moved and you thought, I've got a tale to tell here. Well, yes, <laughs> but really it was, I, I mean, the, the three months before we left the UK, I don't remember much of, I don't, you know, you've moved countries, you know what moving countries is like. No, it's a big, they've done it twice. Yeah. It's horrendous. <laughs> I'm moving to a country where we didn't really know anyone, which was a long way away, which was so completely different. There was, I mean, it was, it was incredibly hard and I was berserk and it was really only about a week before I left. Phil Tro from BBC Radio Manchester said to me, would you do me like a few minutes every week and just tell me how you're getting on? Cause I think, you know, the audience would really like to know how you are. Cause I'd worked for Radio Manchester for many, many, many years, done most of the shows there at some point or another. And he said, I just think they'd like to know how you're getting on. Do you want to do that? And I went, yeah, okay. And I could just about cope with recording five minutes a week. And I would just send him that audio, but I kept it all. And in my head, I was like, I must make a podcast of this. I must make a podcast of this. And was and there then, an influence, was it? Was it, was it maybe you know, a letter from America or anything like that? Was there, was there something you had in mind when you envisaged how you were going to do it? No, I just thought I want to be authentic. I want to tell the truth. I didn't want to make out it was something it wasn't. I, it, and by that, I mean, I didn't want to go, look at me. How cool am I? I've moved to the other side of the world. Woo. It was a, gosh, this is something I've wanted to do for ages. And now it's actually happening. And I'm really scared. I'm really scared. And I'm scared it might not work out. And I'm scared I might be lonely. And I'm scared I'll make a mistake. And I'm scared it'll all go wrong. And I'll regret it. And I just was really, really honest. Because I thought that was really my only criteria. I thought, I just want to share what I'm going through in a way and 
and I wasn't ever going to pretend I just glided into this life easily and go, oh, yeah, I'm just totally down with what's happening in the States here. You know, it was so difficult. And I felt, like I said, a, you know, a fish out of water so many times and, and all the rest of it. And I thought, just be honest. But then, you know, <laughs> for better or worse, the audio gods were smiling and lots of crazy things happened, which made for very good audio and a very, very difficult time. Uh, you know, I did have someone <laughs> who I know an acquaintance from England at some point email me and go, I'm really, really, really sorry you're going through this, but my God, it's really good audio. <laughs> it, is, it is like that. If, you, if you're in a, a situation where you're making a podcast like that, or even if you're doing a breakfast show where you share things, something goes wrong in your life and for a second you go, oh, I can't believe this. And then you think, oh, actually, this is quite a good bit though. You know? <laughs> totally. It's so true. There was a song that was on the radio all the time when we moved here and I'm going to be rubbish and not remember the name of the band or anything now, but it was on all the time on the radio station where Ian used to work. And uh, it started off and it was, it was basically like, Oh, I remember the day that uh, I, I fell over and I twisted my ankle. So I missed the bus and didn't make it to the job interview. And I remember that show we played where only two people showed up. And I remember that time when my girlfriend dumped me in the middle of the restaurant in front of all my friends, lucky me, lucky me. And you're like, lucky me. What? And then it comes to the chorus and the chorus says, a hundred bad days make a hundred good stories and a hundred good stories make me interesting at parties. <laughs> I love that. And that is something that has you know, echoed around my head so many times over the last year when I've gone, why has this happened? I've gone, oh, okay, that'll, that'll, that'll make good audio. <laughs> I can look back and I'm glad I've got this kind of record of it because yeah, it's been really tough. Oh, I've got a I've got a wonky microphone, Al Graham. Oh, that's all right. Well, we're we're getting close to the end now, anyway. Um, so, podcasts, podcast radio is the name of our station. What podcast yeah. do you listen to? Well, I'm in that really strange situation where um, because I make so many podcasts and I listen to audio all day long, it was a bit like I was at university when I, and I I read English literature at uni. And people would say to me, who are your favorite authors? And I was like, I don't know, because all I do is read books. And when I left, I didn't read a book for about four years. So now whenever I'm asked that question, I think, oh, goodness me, I don't know what my favorite podcasts are, because all I do all day is listen to podcasts and they're the ones that I make. Um, but thinking as a sort of bigger picture, I mean, I was totally inspired to make a podcast by Serial, you know, all those years ago. As yeah, I'm sure, yeah, so, yeah. so, so yeah. many people were. Yeah. I really enjoyed... I'm not generally a fan of celeb podcasts because I have that and thing that I think is a ridiculous hangover for being a radio presenter. You know, when you slog your guts out to be a radio presenter and then someone wins some television reality show and gets the breakfast show and you're like, but I've tried to, do what? And I, I remember, so I, you know, I'll be really honest. That when a celebrity podcast comes out, I think, oh, give me a break. Now everyone's going to listen to that one because, you know, I've got friends who've slogged in, in certain uh, genres or sectors for years for podcasting and then some someone from a boy band's wife brings one out and you think oh what so I mean I'm it is what it is but I don't generally listen to a lot of sort of celebrity podcasts I like to listen to ones that are you know a bit flat the Claudia Winkleman Tanya Byron one how did we get here I just thought was extraordinary yeah. and amazing where people who've got issues in their life sit down and I you know I really really enjoyed listening to that as I was, as you know, doing a lot of hiking around and driving around Phoenix, that one was really great for me. Oh my gosh, um, Dolly Parton's America. Yeah, I enjoyed. Yeah. So I love. I thought that was really, really well put together. Really well put together. Um, can't even. Think. I mean, fortunately, with Fee and Jane for me, when I moved house and I found a bunch of scorpions in my house, and it freaked me out. No one else was there. The kids were at school. Dave was at work. I was there unpacking boxes and kept finding scorpions. Believe you me, when you find it's terrifying. And that day I put on vintage desert island discs and fortunately with Fee and Jane. And that got me through that day, that sense of normality. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. There are scorpions in your house, but you're listening to fortunately, it's all all right. <laughs> so there are things like that, that I, you know, when I do miss England, because I do, especially when things are hard here and I kind of miss that sense of security that, that I, I associate with England. Um, I found podcasting can be really gentle. And then I'm a bit 
of a I'm not very faithful to podcasts so I like listening to episodes of certain ones so when Ricky Gervais was on the Sam Harris podcast I loved that yeah. and I listened to a few episodes around that and I dip in and out I mean this American life I was obsessed with obsessed yeah. with for oh, years wide, isn't it yeah finally since I've moved here I've not really listened to it which is quite strange um but yeah I dip in and out I have so many on my feed and I dip in and out and um and yeah, it's wherever the mood takes me, really. But I love them. Right. Good. Well, the, the important one is Desert Diaries. Are there any more of yours that you'd like to plug? Well, my goodness me. Um, I feel like I'd have be having to choose between my children here. I could rattle <laughs> off. I mean, there is, um, I do still have on, on, still up on Apple Podcasts and wherever you get your podcasts is what goes on here, which is a series of interviews with people who kind of overcame extraordinary obstacles in their life, which I loved making and was huge therapy for me. <laughs> it was kind of free therapy to hear how people got through really, really bad times. I suppose other podcasts of the same vein have kind of come over and, and taken on, I mean, um, like how to fail with Elizabeth Day is kind of similar. Mine was obviously that tiny and hers was, hers is enormous, but um, what goes on here is still up there. I have, you know, there's some more seasons to go up that, that, that were on Audible exclusively, which, you know, I really love those interviews and I'm really proud of them. And they were really important to me to make those because it's the first kind of bit of creative audio that I had made. And if you listen to Desert Diaries in that first episode that explains why on earth we were made this ridiculous leap, that actually references an interview I did as part of what goes on here with a writer called Craig, who essentially um, was in a dead end job, hated his life, was in an apartment that had actual rats in it, um, which the landlord then put the rent up on and he quit his life and went, he'd always dreamed of being a writer. He quit his life, made himself homeless and went and lived on a bench in a local park. And he took pads of paper with him and he said, I'm either going to leave this park because I've written a book and I'm going to change my life or I'm going to die. And that's as strongly as he felt. And guess what? He did the former and he's a best-selling author and he's amazing. And he was a huge inspiration to me in ways that he will never know when I thought about making the leap from a life that was great to a life that could be even better. But you yeah. don't know till you try, do you? Yeah. And what's that one called? What Goes On Here with what Sam goes, Walker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And the one to check out is the award-winning Desert Diaries. Sam Walker, it's been fabulous. Oh, thanks. Really You've nice been, to talk to you. It's great. I, I'm hoping that, you know, people will see you as an inspiration, people who are in a situation who maybe hit 30 and uh, they're thinking of changing their life, whatever it turns out to be, are inspired by your story and the fact that even in your 40s, you can just bite off more than you can chew and chew like buggery. And, I love that. Uh, <laughs> I might get a tattoo, Graham. <laughs>